so pat is an alua woman known nationally and internationally as a powerful advocate for disadvantaged people with a particular focus on the health of australia's first peoples she has extensive experience in aboriginal health including community development advocacy policy formation and research ethics pat has spoken before the united nations working group on indigenous peoples and currently serves as the chairperson of the Lowich Institute, Australian National Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Research. She has also been the CEO of Danilo Dilba Health Service in Darwin, Chair of NACHO, Executive Officer of AMSANT, and was the Chair of the CRC for Aboriginal Health from 2003 until 2009. Pat has had many essays, papers and articles published. She was a co-author with Rex Wall QC of Little Children Are Sacred, a report on the abuse of Aboriginal children in the Northern Territory. Pat achievements have been recognised with many awards, including the Public Health Association of Australia's Sydney Sachs Public Health Medal in 2007, the Human Rights Community Individual Award, the Tony Fitz Tony Fitzgerald Memorial Award in 2012 and an honorary doctorate from Flinders University in 2013. In, 2000, in June 2014, Pat was appointed officer, AO of the Order of Australia for distinguished services to the Indigenous community as a social justice advocate, particularly through promoting improved health, educational and protection outcomes for children. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please put your hands together and welcome Pat to the podium. Thanks, Pat. Um, thanks, John. First of all, I'd uh, like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and honour their ancestors past and present. <clears throat> and I'd also like to thank Amelia for that very warm welcome she gave us this morning and also to Andrew for the um, prayer. Donna, I think this morning, painted the picture into which Amsant inserted itself because of all of those reasons and the things that was wrong. And it was very clear to us that the whole system needed reforming, not just a better allocation of resources, it was more. It was a whole administrative structure and the way resources and the way we were dealt with in the whole um, area. So that's, so based on what we already knew and the reports and what have you, but into that, into that um, landscape, there was a whole network of um, AMSs here in the Northern Territory. And as you know, Congress was set up in 1973. We also had the, the NARS, which has long been known, was never properly um, implemented. So our world in the 1990s, 20 years ago, you know, was really um, um, different. And we decided that we were gonna make a difference because things weren't working for us. So we thought systems change and total reform. And we had some work, we had work had already been uh, done uh, in, that, in that area. For instance, Aboriginal health was not on the national agenda and poor ATSIC had to deal with all things Aboriginal. You know, the Mabo, land, housing, health. So those poor commissioners were expected to be experts on everything to do with Aboriginal Australia. And of course they weren't, not even, you know, federal ministers and politicians now have to be answerable and be expert on everything, but the ATSIC commissioners were expected um, to be these um, experts. <clears throat> While we were in ATSIC, Aboriginal health was underfunded and there were many places which, I think I can use his name now, Puggy Hunter, called busted ass clinics. And I think in the Northern Territory, we still have busted ass clinics. So there's still a lot of um, work to do. And I think the minister herself talked about the difference between Gullawinku and Millingimby. And that's what Puggy would call a busted ass 
uh, clinic. There was no collaborative planning and government just did what they wanted. Uh, NT government did not accept the legitimacy of the, uh, the AMSs. In fact, there was a real tension. With, there really was uh, a them and us. Um, they attacked us for saying that we were duplicating services. They were not prepared to see the difference between what they were, their clinics, and the Aboriginal community controlled um, sector. So there was a whole bunch of stuff going down. Everything was static. There wasn't any new energy coming into it. The whole system needed reforming. So the first thing we knew was that we had to get organised. And then we established... Oh, I forgot about that. Someone, someone's doing that. Thank you. <coughs> Own up. I'm real mild for this stuff, you know. <laughs> so um, we had a fantastic three-day meeting here in Alice Springs in October 1994. And a lot of the services that were established were there. Um, <clears throat> Congress, of course, Worley, MeWatch, Utopia, Dan Ladilba, Onion Ginning, and I think there was a person from Pinterby Health as well. So we had this meeting at um, Red Centre, was it, Mary? Red Centre Resort, okay. And a lot of people were there. Uh, wasn't a big group, but we came with it because we'd all spoken to each other on the phone and decided that we needed to sort of organise ourselves across the Northern Territory. So we did. So we came, we issued a first a press release, which as Donna said, in those days, we were, and their first release, I think, went out under the name of um, CAMS. And that was when they had that, you know, four people were killed, you know, that rich dentist, Japanese dentist came with his Ferrari and killed four people on the road. And they called themselves CAMS, and we thought, oh, we can't go there, death and destruction. We were trying to avoid all of that. So we, that's how we come up with AMPSAND. So that's, that's how it all got started. So, but in, the, in that first press release, we called for greater community control, more resources for the community control sector, and we were really, I'm really happy to say, we were really strong and aggressive policies or pr programs rather about better salaries and conditions, which Donna talked about for Aboriginal health workers. We actually pushed that agenda quite a lot and we were in on the ground floor, people here may or may not remember, the national training reform agenda quite a few years ago, so we knew those health workers had to be protected in some way. So we did a lot of work um, in that area. We had three focus areas, which Donna has already put up a slide about. Um, the national reform of the uh, public health uh, funding and planning, local, mob local mobilisation and support of communities, and even international representation. So we needed, it was really clear to us, we needed a new way of doing business. Recognising average community control health services is an important, res re respected part of the health system. We needed to put that into action and not just words, because there was people, kind of governments didn't believe us. The NT government was in fact um, aggressive um, to us. <clears throat> and greater, greater Commonwealth funding. You know, there's another, another thing too. While we were with ATSIC, there wasn't, just, just wasn't enough money uh, for Aboriginal health. And they were really, really struggling. There's quite a sort of um, story there. And we had also here in Alice Springs, the first and only meeting, conference, we got together all the senior health economists from around the country to a meeting here that AMSAN sponsored. Uh, we had people like John Nebel, Stephen Duckett, um, bless him, you know, poor old um, Gavin Mooney. He'd only been in Australia a couple of weeks. Um, he was here, so there was a whole lot of people here at this meeting just talking about how the system needed to change and how we could get a more equal distribution of uh, funds. So we got all of these um, people here. In fact, it was, I think it was at a hotel here in Alice Springs, Red Centre. It was 37 degrees and no air conditioning. It just broke. So, um, but that was a fairly, uh, it was another initiative of AMSAN to get all the thinkers together and sort of plan, because this returning health was a, a, a deliberate campaign. It was strategic, backed up by um, evidence. 
and that also too that we needed collaborative planning and processes that involved all the players, our sector, ADSIC, um, Territory Health and, and the Commonwealth. As Donna's already, Congress actually um, paid for Beyond the Maze and that was part, that was part one of the strategy to have that out there and keep uh, promoting that. And that was fundamental um, to the reforms uh, that happened. So we didn't just go to Canberra though with good ideas and thumping the table and saying things, running a line like, we're black and we do what we do and you should give us more money. That was never ever part of the plan. It was a persuasive, strategic, well thought out campaign from our point of view. And then AMSAT itself, funded again, I think, by Congress, um, the way forward. That's still available and it's a really, it's, it's like our charter. It sets out all the changes that we were able to um, make happen with the transfer of, the, of, of funds. And we made a, a case for greater investment. We try to use the language of the day as well. Greater investment and how to reform um, the system. So how did we do this? We got on a plane to Canberra, to Canberra lots of times, armed with all of this um, ammunition. And um, in those days, there was no formed AMSAT. We had no money. All of this was funded by the individual services. Congress footed the bill lots of times. Those of us who went on those delegations were funded by our services. Marion went, she was funded by Worley. I went, I was funded by Poor old DD, who really didn't have a lot of money. So it was a great commitment by the AMSANT service members to what they, because they understood what we were trying to do here. And the point I want to make also, which is how we ended this previous session, was that why we do all this and why we did it was to provide better services to our communities and in many cases, indeed, our own families. So that's at the core. That's the nub of what it means to be an Aboriginal community controlled health service. So many visits to Canberra. And at the same time, we had other groups of people like um, David Legg and Ben Bartlett, you know, promoting uh, Beyond the Maze, promoting uh, the ways forward. So the, we didn't just go there like an unguided missile, if you like. It had all been pre-planned and a whole lot of meetings had been held and we had a whole lot of people talking um, to other people. As a result um, of all of that, we went to the sort of groundbreaking meeting in uh, Canberra in February 1995. It was an AMSAN delegation and um, down the Dilbert Congress uh, were there. But also we enlisted the aid of other Aboriginal organisations. For instance, Noel Pearson was very powerful then as he is now. So we phoned him, Steffi Bell and I phoned him and said what we were doing, would he come? We said, we just want you to talk. And he, to his credit, he says, okay, what do you want me to say? Central Land Council, we approached them here. Um, they sent um, Tracker Toolmouth. And Barbara Flick was working for AMA as their first Indigenous officer then. She was also there. So we had this, um, this big meeting with the cabinet of the day this is Paul Keating's um, government now, so they're all there on one side and we were um, on the other side. But they too had been lobbied by a whole lot of friends and supporters, so they kind of knew what we were sort of on about and what, what we were talking about, so we didn't have to educate them, we could just get down to business, so to speak. And what we argued for was the um, transfer, those three things up there, transfer of responsibility for funding primary health care from ATSIC to the Commonwealth Health the creation of regional planning bodies, the creation of a National Indigenous Health Council. I just want to go back to, it was controversial then and for some people it remains controversial, the fact that AMSANT, us mob in the Northern Territory up there, took Aboriginal health off ATSIC. So we were very careful when we planned the campaign, it was never ever an attack on ATSIC because you know, our relatives and friends were on those regional councils and were, I think, Johnny, you were a commissioner then. So um, we were really careful about how we approached this. So it wasn't a criticism of ATSIC, so we took the agenda up there. 
it needs to be reform, what you're doing is wrong, and there needs to be a more equal distribution, and this is how you should do it, without going there. I don't think we were given any credit, really, for doing that, but um, we were really careful and really, really mindful about that. You know, because it was just, in those days, anyhow, it was just too easy, you know, to kick the camp dog at sick, and we were determined that we're not going to do that, that our thinking would be, is much, was and is much more sophisticated. So we met with ministers and whole, uh, all the senior um, bureaucrats uh, at the time, so it was a whole um, thought-through um, campaign. Eventually, then, in May 1995, the, the announcement was made to transfer Aboriginal health back to the very huge Department um, of Health now. We knew also this was fraught. And so we needed to have, within that then called Department of Health, this huge structure, we needed to have our own um, agents or our own body, if you like, and it was our idea that was in um, the ways forward and what have you to set up the Office for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Services, it was, but they soon dropped the S, but that's okay. And that was a small department of about two people. But their job, they had, their role was two, two, two things they had to do, was to advocate internally within that huge department of health, to advocate for more, for, for the Aboriginal community controlled health sector, and then to access all the funds that was available across that huge, you know, population health, um, mental health, they used to call it in those days. So there was money there and we said, they, their job inside the department was say, don't forget Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health as well. So they kind of, and to increase that budget that ATSIC had. And I think Donna showed some figures. I mean, there's been a huge increase in the funds that's gone to Aboriginal health as a result um, of the transfer. We set up the framework agreements, uh, the health council, all of regional planning bodies, and we did increase the funding. So we had this plan, it was already, already laid out at the time that the Prime Minister made the announcement to transfer. And there's still some wounds um, from that time. So that the next slide is just to, Donna showed a really good slide, but this is a much simpler one, just to sort of show per person. Um, how much the funding um, has, in, has increased per head, and this is from the, uh, on the, the references there. But in those days too, a lot of the AMSs, like when I, I was working at uh, the CEO of Dan Ladulba then, and the per head spendage on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in Darwin was um, $70 a head out of Medicare. So there's been a huge difference there. We at um, Dan Ladilba in those days, we had a health worker first policy, which meant that when you come in the door, you saw the health worker first and they had the consulting rooms and then re they were referred to um, our doctors who had shared one little pokey room, eh, hey, David? And there was a tray there where the patient's file went and the doctors just took the tray out. So we weren't eligible really to access Medicare because we weren't seeing the doctor, so we couldn't swipe the card. So that was another whole process. We had to sort of talk to, John Deeble was fantastic. We had so many conversations with him. And he also became a champion for changes um, to, the, uh, to, to Medicare. So that was, a, that was a big help. So as well as that national stuff and all this, at the same time we were bringing along, you know, the local communities. We had those, um, those summits. The first one was in El Perla. What isn't up there? Can I have the next slide, please? What isn't up there is, uh, and I only, only remembered it last night, oh, I should have said, what I'm presenting today are the recollections and memories of Edward Tilton and myself. So feel free to contact and add to stuff or correct stuff. We just kind of got on the phone and did this, um, put all these ideas down. So it's really from um, Edward and I, but it does fit in nicely with the, we didn't collaborate on any of this, we just went in our separate ways and did the presentations for today, but so far uh, um, it's kind of fitting in. <coughs> but these summits, um, we had the first one at El Perla, outside of here at Alice Springs, we had the second one at um, Barnack Jail, and that's where we made this banner. We're out there outside of um, Catherine, in the bush there, Wesley was um, hosting it, and we made this banner. And those sort of squares there, 
all the different groups that were there all kind of did a drawing of the banner. And we had a Singer sewing machine. There's a great photo somewhere of, I think, some, a young man from Miwatch with no shirt on and the shorts, and he's sitting there sewing away on, on the Singer sewing machine. And we made that as part of the Bunnock Gel. And everybody who was there submitted um, a painting or a drawing, and it was transferred into satin. And that's how we come to have the banner. And then we had the, um, the summit at um, Galkala. These were huge events. And then the one here at, um, at Ross River, which I'm sorry I missed off. I only thought about it last night. And that was in 2004. Simon reminded me uh, that was in 2004. And then we had another health summit in Darwin, which was organised differently. And I think it was kind of all get, getting us all together. And I think we had a big fight with Central Land Council. <laughs> Top in. Yeah, we had the two of them. Anyhow. Johnny, you remember that? Yeah. So uh, I forget what it was about now. Eh? Oh, we got told to leave Alice Springs at one stage, but uh, that's true, that's true. And we got told to leave at Tennant Creek <laughs> as well. Me and Steffi, twice, twice. <laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> it's all, it was all part of this, um, Reform, this reform agenda. So we had the big one here in, in Ross River. And, you know, 300 people would turn up, all kinds of little families and little communities. I remember the one we had up at um, Gulkala. All the old ladies, you know, from Tenegru, they used to come, they were singing and dancing, and they came in the bus, and all big mob of Congress people came. And we were from the top end, we came down little, we come around the, you know, in the truck, around the corner, and there's water on the road. This is up, you know, Nullumboy up in Arnhem Land there, here's all the centre mob in the water, swimming with dogs and everything. We said, get out, get out of the water, there's crocodiles there, you know. They said, what, what, get out. So, <laughs> we couldn't, we said, look at them desert mob, they're all swimming there in that water. <laughs> so we talked over, these were about a week, Five days, lots of time to talk over and over and over stuff. So when we did go to Canberra, our mob at home knew what we were doing and what we were going to say and who we were going to visit and what have you. So everybody locally, all of our members knew what was happening. And we discussed things like the concerns that we we're worrying for, what they were worrying for, how to improve health and the services. Um, we talked about the social disturbance of health. And one of the big things that was happening at the time also they were once again talking about statehood for the Northern Territory, so we talked to you know, our members about that. We talked about the Land Rights Act, there was threats to change that. We talked about family relationships. So we just talked through in our own time a whole lot of um, issues as well as what, and the big things, what was happening with the, um, the transfer. And we didn't have any of our member services disagreeing. And like I say, they funded these trips, the publications, and everything that was happening. So we all had to go back and, of course, convince our boards that this was what was needed. So it was a huge lot of um, work. At the same time as doing the national and the local and the regional, we also decided that we should present at the United Nations Working Group on Indigenous Populations. So once again, Congress funded Edward Tilton, who's here. Edward's been with us from day one. He finished ANU and got on a motorbike and came to Alice Springs and then to Darwin. He hasn't been home yet, or he's gone home now, only just recently. So he came straight to us uh, from ANU. Lots of doctors in the room came also as registrars and stayed and didn't go home when their kids are all born here now. So um, we went off to um, Geneva and we actually spoke. We addressed um, the United Nations um, Atsik was there as well, and honestly, to her credit, Loach, of course, was leading the delegation, and we sort of, she called, it, called a caucus, and um, we were all sort of sitting there, sort of you know, a bit nervous, I have to say, and she said, you a health mob? We said, yeah. She knew that, of course. She said, you a health mob? We said, yes. Are you speaking? Yes, please. <laughs> all right, you have the floor. Do not go over time, 
and make sure you're prepared. Yeah, yeah, we're prepared. <laughs> and we were, so she was very gracious. So ATSIC didn't take the floor, she gave that time um, to us. And what we had, as well as delivering the paper, which I'm sure, John, we have somewhere. I hope someone's got it anyhow. Um, we, are, we also, at the same time, in that paper, we advocated for the United Nations to recognise community control in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, we also wanted them to hold a conference on the health of world's Indigenous people, give a report card of how it's happening in each of the nation states, and produce a report on the health of the world's indigenous peoples. Of course, they didn't do any of that, um, but it was a good idea, and um, we were advocating for that very strongly. So where we are today, celebrating 20 years and 40 years um, of Congress, which has, been, which has really been um, the gold standard for AMSs, and um, they've been very um, staunch and committed supporters to AMSAND and the agenda, and have put their hands in their pocket numerous occasions. But anyhow, what did we learn from this? We knew that we had to be um, organised and we had the intellectual know-how plus um, policy ad activism and to equal positive change. We knew the importance of building alliances with a whole range of people, but you know, we wouldn't have talked to the AMA. We, you know, we didn't even know about the AMA. Some of our doctors weren't even members, you know. They were members of OSMOF or something, which I don't know where that still exists, um, but that was their little protest. So, you know, they're a really powerful group, so we were able to convince them. But once again, I think through um, Barbara Flick and having that um, Aboriginal person within their office. We talked to the Land Council. I have to say they were, at the time, they also understood what we were trying to do and were happy to provide um, the support and we talked to Nacho, and we also had um, quite good support from around the country, plus all these health economists who understood what we were trying to do. But we also had uh, good ministers, you know, good ministers, meaning ministers who were helpful and supportive. You know, Carmen Lawrence was just great, and so was Michael Woodridge. And also Tony Abbott, he was the Minister for Health when we introduced the Primary Health Care Access Program. So he was one of the few people that actually got it, so we need to revisit him as well. Because he, was a, he kind of was an okay um, health minister. He was quite, he was conscientious and he came out here quite a few times. In fact, he came to Alice Springs and he phoned up Steffi and I, said, we're in Alice Springs. When do you want us to come to Congress? Uh, how long do you want us to come? Oh, and by the way, will you come to dinner tonight and bring uh, other organisations if you'd like to? Um, that was the response we got then. And also it confirmed the strength and creativity of the sector and the communities, that's all of you and all of your communities and your families over this um, last um, 20 years. I just want to um, close by saying that um, Donna's talked about it and so has Marion and I'm going to add my voice to it. I seriously think that we need to consider another kind of campaign. For the first time ever, we have a Minister for Health who refuses to meet with the sector at all. This is unheard of. So we can't build a relationship when you can't want to talk to people. We've complained, of course, a lot to Fiona Nash, who's really trying and has been uh, very accessible to us and does understand, but she still isn't um, the Minister for Health. Uh, I know, is Rachel still here? Oh, yes, Rachel's here. Rachel was working in the office in, um, OATC office in uh, Darwin. So she's in Fiona Nash's office. We're very happy about that because at least she understands about um, Aboriginal health. And um, Fiona Nash's chief of staff is also the advisor to Kay Patterson when she was the Minister for Health and we did a quite a lot of work um, with her as well. So we have some um, entree into Fiona's office, but for the first time ever, none whatsoever to do uh, with the, uh, the Minister for Health. And that's... Um, really unheard of. So I would like to add my voice to um, some kind of advocacy, some kind of campaign to put ourselves back on the agenda. I think we've become a little bit too complacent um, and we're just kind of lying down here. 
So um, I think there's, there, there's time. But look, thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here in Alice. It was so good getting off the plane and coming home again and uh, seeing you all. I've seen people here I haven't seen for ages and it's been a real, um, real, real pleasure. And I was so pleased to be asked um, to speak today. And it's really nice to, to see everybody. And it's a great, it's a great story. And it needs to be told, um, John. So somehow or other we're gonna, hopefully, mm. um, we'll pull all this um, together with the images and the papers and, and do something with that. In fact, even the Neho Nacho story still hasn't been done. This, this whole involvement of Aboriginal people in our own health is 50 years old. In fact, Neho was at Alma Ata in Russia and we helped draft the Alma Ata Declaration. Um, there's a whole world here that the rest of Australia doesn't know about uh, and, it, and it's a great story. I mean, it, you know, we should get Ivan Sven to do a film. But uh, anyhow, it's great to see you here and I'm really looking forward to the, to the whole time that, that we're here. It's a wonderful thing to celebrate and AMSAN has just done a fantastic job and our services do um, as well. So um, it's really nice to be home. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And uh, look, we're ecstatic and overwhelmed when we phoned you to see whether you'd be available to be one of our keynote speakers here. And uh, as you're well aware, you know, um, you're a trailblazer, you and many others, uh, for the establishment of AMSANT and the continuing strengthening um, of Aboriginal community control health services, not only just here in the Northern Territory, but nationally. So, uh, and thank you for sharing um, your story and experiences and like you say, there's, uh, we've got to ensure that that's recorded, documented and archived for future generations so that uh, not only us Aboriginal Torres Strait, Torres Strait Islanders of Australia know about it, but the broader uh, Australian community, because it is a very, very important story.